yo the dude's like hey guys i built this mega prison and honestly if we just basically put everyone in prison then no one is a criminal no one can do crimes it's crazy I'm saying it. we are now going to move on to the el salvador prison this is lucito luisito cominica cominica 42 million subscribers on this channel this video has 23 million views <clears throat> and he made i think come the lord is waiting for us an english dubbed video about the situation in the el salvadoran prisons insane next we will enter an isolation cell which is where prisoners are sent when they commit an infraction the only light entrance is a hole in the ceiling how many people did you kill i do not remember how many were there? We have committed different crimes at different times. Absolutely everything is done in here, from going to the bathroom to cleaning up. Everything is done in here open. This group behind me alone is very possibly responsible directly or indirectly for more than 200 homicides. We are in El Salvador. Thank you, 34 MKD. And today we will enter the terrorism confinement center. The large that guy was getting cooked by a lot of Latinos because he made this video very pro-industrial prison system. Largest prison in the Americas with a capacity to house about 40 zero prisoners, of which today a significant percentage are dangerous. 40 zero, 40,000. Gang members and criminal leaders considered terrorists. This is a maximum security prison, and this is evident from the moment you are perhaps a kilometer from its perimeter, because there are already security elements that begin to interrogate you. They get out of your vehicle, they do a body search, they check. Okay. The perhaps makes it seem like this is definitely an AI dub. Immediately. Immediately, this is an AI dub your identification who are you what are you doing here they tell me that there are seven security filters those that are imposed which makes it practically an impossible it literally sounds as if it's luisito himself was doing the dub i mean he might have read it mission for anyone to enter or leave without full authorization in this video we will know a little of how life is here inside what are some methods and punishments that are imposed to control today's inmates what are some of the rules that the country has imposed to control the situation with its criminals come the lord is waiting for us let's give him what to come in of course they take all your belongings phone wallets nothing you can get in it is even very interesting that the prison is built with a technology that does not allow a telephone signal so that nothing really communicates from inside here. So it's one big giant Faraday cage. How this got 23 million views? This channel has 40 million subscribers, dude. It has 43 million subscribers. I mean, think about it this way. Normally, YouTube would never serve me this channel's videos because it's a Spanish-speaking channel. They also pass you to one floor where they search you, they take off your shoes, they even check the thickness of your socks. It is not for nothing that it is defined as a maximum security prison. When a person deprived of his freedom, that is a prisoner, enters here, his whole body is searched with a technology that allows us to literally see if there is anything inside his body, data capture is taken, and he proceeds to go to the module assigned to him. Oh, by the way, we are able to enter to document with special press permits, but we do not really admit any type of visit. People deprived what? of their liberty in these types. So, what does that even mean? We do not admit any type of permit? What? So, prisons specially designated for terrorists are not entitled to any visits. Nothing about, I want to see my mom, I want to see my wife, my daughter, nothing. You lost that right because of the decisions you made in the army. Oh my God, this guy, what's up with this guy? Is he like a fascist? What's happening? Is this a mistranslation or is this dude just like insane? He's like, yeah, you made decisions, criminal. First of all, I hope everybody understands that obviously El Salvador has a massive issue with crime, specifically the two American created gangs that 
and the irony is lo not lost on me, the United States of American prison system literally sent back to El Salvador without informing the government at the time. That's right. You know when Trump says, like, they're opening up their prisons and they're sending their rapists and murderers and drug dealers? Like, we did that to El Salvador. We literally did that to El Salvador. We did that. That's why they have such a massive, exploding, uh, uh, militarized gang problem in the country. And he's explaining the viewpoint of El Salvador, but it's true that in the original video, he doesn't seem to frame the jail as a he doesn't seem to frame the jail as a bad thing. So, um, what? It's not AI. It's just a literal one-to-one -one translation because of the word he uses. The mannerisms. Pin me. I'll explain. So, Bukele is uh, Palestinian. And originally rose to power, as we talked about time and time again, as like a bit of a leftist guy, and then very quickly became a crypto guy. And now on top of being a uh, crypto guy, he's now also like created this mass prison and is dumping anyone and everyone that is even remotely tangentially related to uh, any of the gangs in El Salvador. But because the gang violence in El Salvador is like unimaginably bad. This kind of like almost dictatorial action or not almost like straight up dictator style action is not necessarily perceived as like as damaging as you would think. As a matter of fact, it has <laughs> actually got him a tremendous amount of praise as far as I understand. Partially once again, due to the fact that the gang violence situation was insane. Who's paying the price of El Salvador's war on gangs? Oh, this was the video I was supposed to watch originally. Did it solve the game? Uh, did it solve the crime problem or are the gangs still operating? As far as I understand, the gangs are still operating, but nowhere near the same severity as, as they once were. However, the real issues are not on uh, the, the, the way to deal with violent crime, which, by the way, obviously there are. Uh, much better ways of trying to deal with violent crime in this way. Because this is not like a long... This is not a... He sounds based as fuck. I'm confused as to why you're against him. I don't know if you know this, but like... Uh, I am a believer in rehabilitation over incarceration. This is going to cause unimaginable long-term problems. You cannot just simply take people and like trap them in an area and be like, all right, we're done with it. I live in the United States of America, and let me tell you, we did that, and it's really bad, and it doesn't work. The other problem here is also that given the, the severity and given the streamlined approach to dealing with this, given the streamlined approach to dealing with like uh, uh, crime in this incredibly ultra-draconian fashion, you're going to throw a lot of innocent people in jail for being tangentially related to a group that might even be threatening you to do the crimes. Because when we're talking about like a narco state, a lot of the people that are joining MS-13 uh, MS are not joining because they want to. They're joining because they're fucking threatened and they have no way to prove their innocence at all. Or family members of criminals, like they're doing dragnets and it is completely removing them of any kind of human rights. And it is legitimately terrifying it's especially terrifying and i i believe it's a testament to like how bad the crime issue was in el salvador because he is insanely popular also a lot of informal economies comprised of jobs connected to the game so the people getting the most fucked are those who had no choice but to participate rather than the bosses one issue country yeah i mean it makes sense it is the issue for understandable reasons make no mistake El Salvador crime rate and statistics for 2018 was 53.31%, which was still at a decline of 15% from 2017. Oh my God. He won all of Salvador in Congress yesterday. The PNLY opposition to win renounced her party and went independent. It should also be mentioned there is still no legal right to an attorney if you get arrested and thousands of inmates have not had a trial. Oh yeah. Exactly. There are also many reports of journalists that have reported him on uh, on him badly being put in. It's awful. I've got an uncle that's literally old time Marx. He's got a Che tattoo and he sounds like this. I try to explain to my family and it's just not processing. 
The crime situation in El Salvador was horrendous. The draconian response was shown massive improvements, but as you said, unimaginably cruel long-term circumstance. Surely a functional military-powered police state has turned out well historically in Central South America. Yeah. It's so funny that people don't understand, like, what the implications of such a thing uh, are. What the implications of such things are. But, of course, when you got 53% uh, crime that is on a decline, mind you, of course people are going to be like, yeah, no, actually, it's, it's pretty awesome. But first, a special report from El Salvador, where there are growing concerns about the number of children and women being imprisoned without a fair trial. Oh, what a start. What a start to the subject matter. Growing concerns of the number of women and children being imprisoned without a trial? It's like one of those things where it just got progressively worse as the sentence continued, dog. What the f The Central American country introduced tough laws last year to tackle the shocking numbers of murders and violence crime carried out by gangs. But the United Nations, among others, say the measures have come at the expense of human rights with arbitrary arrests, torture and deaths. In 2015, there were more than six and a half thousand murders in El Salvador, the worst murder rate in the world. By last year, the number of murders had fallen by 92% to fewer than 500. The current prison population there has now swelled to between 90 and- Oh, it's not 53%, it's 53 people per 100,000. In 1994, it was 135 per 100,000. And 100,000. But more than 1,000 children and 8,000 women have been arrested and detained. And one investigation found only 30% of those arrested actually have links to gangs. Yo! Yo, what the f yo, the dude's like, hey guys, I built this mega prison. And honestly, if we are, if we just basically put everyone in prison, then no one is a criminal. No one can do crimes. It's crazy. Dude, it is terrifying how popular he is for this, by the way. People love this shit until they go to jail. Our correspondent, Dan Rivers, traveled to El Salvador and sent this report. <laughs> In El Salvador's war against gangs, there is no mercy. Inmates are treated like enemy combatants, prisoners of a war where the rule of law is often ignored. The country's new mega prison is the largest in Latin America, space for 40,000. As this footage released by the government shows, some are barely adults. Once feared members of the MS-13 or Barrio 18 crime networks are off the streets and forced into submission. My life ended the day they took my children away from me. Yvette Toledo lives with the legacy of their murderous reign. Tattoos equals criminal? I mean, this is the one case where, like, you know, I mean, very specific tattoos, of course. I'm willing to bet that if you have any tattoos whatsoever, you might get in trouble in El Salvador. But, like, yeah, this it's like the Yakuza. They... They get very specific tattoos to to designate what they're what gang they're a part of. It is literally notice how a lot of those tattoos have 13 on them. That's not an accident. You know what I mean? She has permanent. Nobody's like, oh, I really like this number. Police protection after her son and daughter were decapitated by the gangs. My life would have been different in all areas. My life is very different now in every way. They didn't just take away half of my life. They took away my dreams and the future I had with them. But the anguish isn't confined to the victims of the gangs. Plenty of innocent people have been rounded up as the government tries to tackle them. Carla's husband, Milton, is being transferred to the mega prison after a police raid last year. The police killed them, they shot them with guns. In which she claims officers executed her cousin and beat her. Oh. That was a horrible... Yeah, by the way, uh, good point from a chatter, but this is the kind of people that are seeking asylum in the U.S., by the way. Like, these are the people who are like, hey, um, you kind of f***ed up our country. Can we, can we come there? Because, like, they killed my cousin and they said, I'm next. It is like... It is the most insane thing because like this is this is a gang that was directly created in Los Angeles. Okay? Straight up. They were arrested, imprisoned, done all of that. 
and then the American government's policy was to fly them to El Salvador, knowing what they know, having the connections that they have with America so they can have a steady flow of weapon shipments and have like direct access to the marketplace, flew them to El Salvador, didn't tell, did not tell the El Salvadoran government at the time that they were actually MS-13 gang members that were, they were shipping to the country and just flew them in. It's nuts. The Mara Salvatruja, or MS-13, is perhaps the most notorious street gang in the Western Hemisphere. While it has its origins in poor refugee-laden neighborhoods of the 1980s Los Angeles, the gang reach now spans from Central America to Europe. A predatory criminal organization, the MS-13, lives, uh, lives mostly from extortion, but the gang's resilience owes to its strong social bonds, which are created and strengthened via acts of violence, mostly directed at their rivals and one another. Their activities have helped make the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras one of the most violent places in the world outside of a war zone. Trucha? Truca? Maras Salva Trucha. Um, anyway. The U.S. Department of Treasury categorized the group as a transnational criminal organization, the first such designation of a U.S. street gang, uh, though the MS-13 criminal proceeds do not even approach those of their counterparts on that list. The U.S. government has also charged over a dozen MS-13 leaders in it means trout saver um okay the u.s government has also charged over a dozen ms-13 leaders in el salvador with terrorism marking an unprecedented escalation in countries fight against international street gangs the gang has suffered a near fatal blow in its spiritual home el salvador following a historic security crackdown implemented by the administration of president naib bukele palestinian by the way palestinian uh descent um that has seen around two-thirds of his broader membership thrown in jail History is, it was founded on poor marginalized neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Um, as a result of the civil wars racking El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, refugees floated northward. Many of them wound up in California, living amongst the mostly Mexican neighborhoods of East and Central Los Angeles, as well as San Fernando Valley. While the Mexican gangs reigned in the local underworld, the war-hardened criminal immigrants criminals uh, quickly organized themselves into competing groups, the strongest of which was called Mara Salva Truca, Stoners or MSS. The origins of the name are still disputed, but Mara is a Central American term for gang. Salva refers to El Salvador. Truca is a slang term for clever or sharp. Salva Truca also, was also given the name of the locals who fought against William Walker, an ambitious businessman and a proponent of slavery from the United States who tried to subdue various parts of Central America with a small army in the 1950s. Walker, after a brief stint as the self-proclaimed president of Nicaragua, was overrun and executed by Honduran locals. For their part, the stoners were composed of refugees from El Salvador in the Pico Union neighborhood who spent most of their time listening to heavy metal music, drinking, and smoking. With time, the gang evolved, shedding their original stoner image, and the MSS became MS. The gang's rivals took note. Conflict between the MS and the 18th Street, Barrio 18, was particularly fierce in and around Los Angeles. The fighting put the gang on the radar of officials who began to jail them in large numbers in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Inside the prison, the MS was forced to bow to another master, the Mexican Mafia, or La M. For short, whose power extended from the jails to the streets, the Mafia's umbrella, known as Sureños, uh, included many prominent gangs and stretched into much of the southwest of the United States and Mexico. The MS-13's subservience afforded the gang more protection in the streets and in prison. In return, the MS provided hitmen and paid the Mafia regular quotas from their criminal proceeds. It also added the number 13, the position M occupies in the alphabet, to their name. Thus, MS became MS-13. What? God, MS is boring as fuck to talk about. Gonna go mainline some Fenty. Kaya, stop licking your arm. Why are you keep licking your... Ah! Kaya, stop it. Oh. You're gonna get a hot spot. By the mid-1990s, partly as a way to deal with the gangs and partly as a uh, product of the get-tough immigration push towards the end of the presidency of Bill Clinton, the U.S. government began a program of deportation of foreign-born residents convicted of a wide range of crimes. This enhanced deportation policy vastly increased the number of gang members being sent home to El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and elsewhere. Like, half of these countries we f***ed up with direct CIA intervention, then their refugees come to America... We don't offer them any f pathway to like citizenship or economic help. Then they obviously go into a life of crime due to one deal with the other criminal entities that exist in their neighborhoods. And also because they have to resort to such means for survival. Then 
they take all of the information and all of the experience that they have of like one a lot of them are also former military members too so remember that they're like literally dudes who either fought alongside whichever fascist entity was put into position of power or against so they have like literal military vet experience they come to america and then they get the criminal experience and access to a marketplace and also weaponry and international uh an international network of criminals then they get dumped back into el salvador like sydney sweeney dumping her titties out on a movie on any movie really without even giving knowledge to the mother government it is like a perfect it's a perfect shitstorm. it's a nice analogy i think it's a phenomenal analogy salvadoran chatter and one of the few that fucking hates bukele he's incredibly popular because one of salvadorans are fucking reactionaries two bukele has technically brought down crime even though all he's doing is jailing people with tattoos a lot of salvi see tattoos as taboo due to religion that felt like a microaggression against what ladies with big hoo-hahs like what the fuck I believe in a path to citizenship, but the U.S. really hasn't intervened in any of those countries in, the, in 30 plus years. Dog, they didn't come here last year. What the fuck are you talking about? We already gave you the historical reference point. They came here in the 80s. I wonder what had happened in the decade, two decades prior. That's the whole point. They came here in the 80s as refugees, as veterans who are also refugees uh, they, uh what, what am i doing i'm just repeating exactly what i just explained literally five minutes ago what the fuck is wrong with me okay also our interventions in honduras has not stopped or uh, guatemala nor uh, el salvador el salvador the currency is the dollar if i'm not mistaken one other thing that javier malay should look forward to if he actually continues uh on his um uh, on his wonderful journey of uh, dollarizing argentina no, it's not actually Bitcoin. Uh, the currency, the original, the original currency was the dollar. They still trade on the dollar. They have Bitcoin, but nobody uses Bitcoin. Don't be delusional. You physically cannot use Bitcoin on simple purchases. That would be insane. Ugh. Crypto maximalist, dude. Anyway, by the mid-90s, partially as a way to deal with the gangs, uh, Bill Clinton shipped them off. According to one estimate, 20,000 criminals returned to Central America between 2000 and 2004. The trend continued over time. U.S. immigration authorities removed nearly 6,000 suspected gang members of 2018 alone. Around 1,300 of them are from MS-13. Central American governments, some of the poorest, Central American governments, some of the poorest and most ineffective in the Western Hemisphere, were not capable of dealing with the criminal influx. I mean, this is like written by a fucking reactionary dude, it seems. The convicts who often had only the scarcest connection in their countries of birth had little chance of integrating in a legitimate society, and they often turned to gang life. Ding, ding, ding. In this way, the decision to use immigration policy as an anti-gang tool helped spawn the virulent growth of the gang in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Oh, Central American government, some of the poorest. Uh, nor were they properly forewarned by U.S. authorities, by the way, th which is the most important part. Can you imagine being like a poor-ass poor ass central american nation like in the throes of dire economic circumstances and constant conflict and they just again dump out twenty thousand hardened veterans that now also are a part of an international criminal network with a direct way into the american marketplace they dumped them like sydney sweeney's juicy titties they dumped them out this ain't euphoria they did a euphoria in el salvador like surprise it's not tits Twenty thousand criminals okay the convicts who often had only the scarcest connection uh the ms13 principal activities uh, vary a great deal from one region to another this is my streamer bro i'm getting banned you haven't even seen euphoria i don't have to see euphoria to know that sydney sweeney dumps out her boobs in it this is why i can't recommend you to coworkers. oh i'm sorry do they not like do they not like jokes or do they not like jokes specifically about Sydney Sweeney's boobs? I'm sorry guys, I watched SNL as as you did too. So I don't know why you're like what do you mean? This should be on all of our minds. It's certainly on mine. The crimes such as extorting bus companies are arguably more disruptive on a daily basis to more people than any other criminal activity in the region in the United States. MS13 focuses on local drug sales and protecting urban turf to extort small businesses and underground bars. Ugh. Anyway, they do like uh, international human trafficking, stuff like that. 
they're also notoriously very violent, like more so than even other gangs. Like they, the, the decapitation and stuff like that. They're like, they, they are like the, the cartels in that way. You call boobs hoo-hahs and I need you to know that means vaginas. Okay, never mind. My bad. Yeah. Kind of crazy that we did the exact thing export criminals Trump is accusing of foreign countries. Yes, that's why every case of conservative commentary is just projection. Every time someone has a reactionary approach, recognize that they're most likely projecting. Trump is literally bringing back McGumbo's. True. McGumbo's. Okay, that's not the point. I've deviated eight times away from the original video that we were watching. We looked at statistics. We looked at Bukele. We looked at another YouTuber. Let's finish this and then we'll get back to the criminal, the, the insane uh, Guantanamo Bay style prison they have. We lived a humble life, but we lived well. We had everything. And in one second, they destroyed everything. It's awful. The authorities here have extraordinary powers under the state of emergency declared in March last year. In different places, we catch them. We're on patrol with the army in what used to be a no-go zone for them. Hassan Ist followed you. Thank you for Ist following me. As we climb further into this former gangland, suddenly the loud rap music draws their attention. Oh. Play the wrong songs here, oh. and this happens. The teenager seems to know the drill. They check him for tattoos. This seems like a good, this seems like a good way to deal with this. Even on his scalp. This used to be one of the most dangerous areas in El Salvador, but now, as you can see, the army are very keen to show us they're in control. Normality is returning here, but it's been imposed down the barrel of a gun. At night, the police patrols are even more risky. We're following a so-called rapid intervention raid on one of the poorest neighborhoods. Dark alleys no. and nervous residents as the police move through. Here officers arrest an alleged gang collaborator. They won't tell us what evidence they have against this shopkeeper, but they admit he'll be sent to prison and will wait months for a trial. Yeah. Y'all think this shit's good, dude? <laughs> Again, the original video started with women and children are being locked up in increasingly higher rates uh, without any evidence whatsoever. And then they also snuck in that 70% of those incarcerated have no evidence against uh, them as, as uh, being an active participant in MS-13 or any of the gangs. So basically, in many ways, it seems like violence has only changed hands. It went from anarcho-capitalist-ass criminal elements to the single, unitary, monopoly on violence-holding state with very little paperwork associated with the actual uh, conduct, too. They're not like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> minus 40% crime rate, but plus 40% crime rate of police. Being young and male here, because here's the other problem. Remember, if the operating, if the, the modus operandi before this government is working with gangs because either A, you have no other outlet, like you have no other way of making money, or B, because you've been extorted or threatened into working with the gangs, you're f like, there is no, there, there is no way of like approaching the situation you're basically just doing a dragnet. One of the chatters pointed out that if you live in those areas, you are probably 100% indirectly related to one of those gangs. Yes. It's a risky business. <laughs> the findings of our investigation show only 30% of those that have been detained under the state of emergency laws I support have getting any criminals and their associates off the streets. Yes, bro, because you live in America, dumbass, and you're probably a white guy living in Connecticut. So you have no. Like this would be akin, and I'm not going. I'm probably only going to reinforce your bigotry here. This would be like if if the American government went into like every black neighborhood and arrested every black person. Okay, which I suspect you would also be in support of. <laughs> like gangs are not the answer. What, what 
What, what happens when you don't have anything? Also, the government is acting like a gang now. You know what I mean? Kind of link with the gangs. Soyapango used to be a battlefield where three gangs fought for supremacy. Now its streets hum with life again. But everywhere there are dark memories. The corner of the football pitch was where gang members executed anyone. My mom is screaming, she loves Bukele, Lamont, I'm lost, she doesn't know anything. I mean, dude, I get, by the way, this isn't like America at all. This is one instance where I do kind of understand why there's so much reactionary sentiment towards any kind of criminality. If you're a, if you're El Salvador, an expat, if you're literally living here and you're uh, descendants of, of refugees who are Salvadoran themselves, or if you are directly still connected to El Salvador and, and, uh, and have been victimized by constant, unrelenting, gang violence, then yeah, you're going to have a very reactionary approach to that sort of thing until the government decides you are also connected criminally to the gangs. In which case, it seems like you would probably want some paper trail, right? You would want like a little bit of legal uh, grounds to be able to be unlawfully detained, it seems. In which case, you're not going to be so happy when that happens. You know what I mean? Because it's not like these gangs start off by being like, we're going to be violent and kill everyone in the neighborhood. They, th this is how it first starts. They start off by being like, oh yeah, we're going to, you're in dire economic circumstances. We're going to help you out. And then it evolves into what it became. And that is kind of what the, the El Salvadoran government is doing in an almost identical fashion. The only difference is they are sanctioned by the international community, it seems. One who resisted them. The kit was from a rival area controlled by the Mau Mau gang. Ellen Nielsen remembers the bad days during a match he saw gang members killing a 16-year-old player in front of hundreds of spectators. The man shot him, then he took out the magazine, put another bullet in, then shot him again. He shot him about 20 times. They tried to create a parallel state El Salvador's security minister likens the gangs to terrorists, insisting the crackdown was necessary to rebuild society. And of course, you, you can see the people on, on, on our street with hope. But what about the claims that innocent people have been arrested as well? Tell me which police of whatever country that, that you, you choose is only capture uh, guilty people. Okay, um, once again, this is one of those moments where I think it's better to lie just to keep up the appearance and not to be like, yeah, of course we're, you know, throwing innocent people in jail. Everybody does that. That's insane. That's kind of insane. That's not a good argument, dude. What the f***? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a bad argument. He gave up. He conceded and went, no, you. He's not a prison abolitionist, Chatter. He is the guy. He is the jailer. Dude, it is so, it is so insane. Like, he's not wrong. Yes, a lot of innocent people get thrown in prison because the criminal justice system is objectively broken. This is another one of those moments where, like, this is why Trump pops off so hard because he just says it like it is, which means, like, he's an asshole and he's telling you that shit is up and he's going to continue doing it but at least it's like refreshing that he is honest in his dishonesty the government's not just locking up living gang members but also expunging all trace of those who've died by destroying their graves they are dismantling their legacy the crackdown has brought peace but at what cost dam rivers Jesus itv Christ. news el salvador Bro, that's nuts. Now, what needs to happen in this circumstance is also obviously an effort to rebuild society in the image that you think is prosperous. And I suspect given that his like, given his like crypto shit, I don't think he's doing that. Which again, point to no long-term sustainability. There is no long-term sustainability here. If you're just going punish, 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 in the short term, you're like, okay, well, the crime rate is dropping. Sure, if you do dragnets and you fucking lock up anyone that you claim is even, like, remotely affiliated with a gang, 
looked in the direction of a gang and didn't immediately go, oh, I'm scared or whatever the fuck, then yeah, you're going to see a drop in the crime rate because guess what? The criminal entity now is no longer any of the gangs, but the government itself. Even if you don't know much about El Salvador, you've probably seen this face. Soy Nayib Bukele. He's the president of this country and he's very popular. Nayib Bukele often brags on social media about what he's been able to accomplish. Turning one of the most dangerous countries in Latin America into a place where you can now walk freely on the streets. He touts El Salvador as a beautiful tourism destination and as a country that's finally prospering. All because he was able to beat the gangs that used to control this country. But more than four years into his presidency, more and more people are starting to ask, is that the full story? Are the more than 70,000 people who have been arrested really dangerous gang members? And do those beautiful images on social media show what life is really like for most people in El Salvador? Yeah, I like the, I like the notion that so many people that did, don't know what, like, Central America, Latin America look like throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s are like, wow, this seems like a really successful strategy. It's like, no, dude, he's doing the same thing. Like, he's doing the same thing that has been done and was a demonstrable failure time and time again. This isn't new at all, dude. This is the thing. It's just that back in the day, we used to implement it with, like, our military training. Now it's become so streamlined that people do it to themselves, I guess. I don't know how connected this dude is. Aquí estaba lleno de, de muchachos, de las pandillas y todo eso. Nadie podía entrar de otros lugares, así como ustedes que han venido, ¿verdad? Era bien difícil. This is Distrito Italia. It was one of the strongholds of the Mara Salvatrucha 13 gang. Alba Lorena Soto Rodriguez says she always kept her doors and windows closed. Yo les tengo, o sea, yo les tengo miedo. Even before moving here, she says gang members had threatened her. No me querían matar, me dijeron, pero te doy 72 horas para que te vayas. Si te veo de pasar esas 72 horas, le, ya no vas a ir para contar. Oh, chica. ¿Qué sentiste en ese momento? Que el mundo es mejor de yo. Porque dejé a mis dos niños, no tenía para dónde irme. Ellos me amenazaron con armas. At the time, she left the country, but after a few years, she came back to reunite with her family. Once in Distrito Italian, she says gang members set their eyes on one of her daughters. Que le decían de que estaba bien bonita, y yo les tenía miedo porque los veía todos tatuados. Y yo les dio cuarto, y usted le dio, es menor, le decía. Como yo veía las noticias que perdían las hipotas, o que parecían muertos por otro lado. Entonces eso... Oh, me da miedo a mí. She had a reason to worry. Gangs routinely committed brutal violence against women. Este lugar fue un lugar plagado de mara, de pandilleros. Carlos lives in another municipality that was controlled by MS-13. He asked us to conceal his identity because he still fears for his safety. Carlos and his family are farmers. He says gang members used to extort them. De lo poco que nos pagaba nosotros, entre nosotros como familia, como trabajando en las propiedades, reuniendo nuestras 300 dólares que nos pedía, Y lo aportaba, lo aportaba no, a los pandilleros. Un año que no, con los trabajos de nosotros, bueno, fue mal, este, nos atrasamos. Ahí se venían a poner a vigiarnos a nosotros, ¿va? porque no habían aportado esa cantidad de dinero. Entonces, que nos querían matar. Through extortion, the gangs made millions of dollars every year. They forced business owners and workers to pay up or risk getting killed. Me tuvieron en cada una vez. Este, me habían puesto un M6 en la cabeza, amenazándome que me fuera. In 2015, El Salvador had one of the highest murder rates in the world. To understand how gang violence got so bad in El Salvador, we have to talk about U.S. intervention here. Because U.S. policy... Damn. Oh, classic, dude. Oh, oh, classic America bad. What will she say now? God, Hassan, you and all the tankies that you show constantly talk about America bad. Oh, America did this. It's like, oh, oh, God. I will now provide zero evidence as to why America good, and I will also not listen to why America is directly involved in what is going on in El Salvador, and then continue to just simply say, 
Oh, you're a tanky, you're a campus. You say America bad for everything. See that spanned several decades and several presidents helped create the gangs that terrorized the Salvadorian people. First, we need to understand what was happening in the 60s and 70s. El Salvador was ruled by a handful of rich landowners, and that ruling class was exploiting workers, paying them starvation wages, keeping them in poverty. And people got tired of living like that, so they organized to demand better conditions. El Salvador's government responded with violence. Death squads were killing labor organizers, teachers, religious leaders, anyone who dared challenge the interests of the wealthy. And that's when the U.S. comes in, because the U.S. government was directly sending aid and supporting the government that was oppressing its own people. Wait, what? Dude, what? No, say it ain't so. I thought this was rule-based international order. Excuse me. No. What? But the... But we're the good guys in the story, and now you're making me feel like we're the bad guys in the story, and I don't like that. What do you mean to tell me that the United States uh, aided and embedded a, a fascist <laughs> dictatorship comprised of landowning wealthy people that violently toppled a potential socialist uh, revolution? Not even a socialist one. It's just like a normal not even I wouldn't even say socialist revolution, but just like any kind of left adjacent progressive revolution. Why? Well, these were the Cold War years and the U.S. did not want a communist takeover in its backyard to prevent that they would go on to support right wing forces in this country, no matter what atrocities they committed. One of the most glaring examples of how U.S. intervention directly led to Salvadorian deaths was the massacre in El Mozote. Soldiers that had been armed and trained by the U.S. killed almost a thousand. Okay, okay, okay. To be fair, to be fair, guys, I'm sure we properly punished the guys that ran cover for the El Mozote massacre or uh, trained the, the militias that engaged in the El Mozote massacre and definitely didn't continue elevating them to higher positions in society despite the fact that it was obvious that they deliberately covered that up after training the militias that engaged in such atrocious war crimes against children, by the way. Like, one of the most... One of the things I will never forget about learning about the El Mazote Massacre for the first time was the fact that militias would go into fucking neighborhoods where uh, the able-bodied men were out working or, you know, fighting, and they would literally take children, like little babies, away from their parents and chuck them into the air and stab them with bayonets. Yeah. No, I'm not going to tell you that they, the guy who did that it was elevated to be the national security advisor. No shot. That would be crazy. I mean, no, 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 no. We would never do that. No. Who's this Elliot Abrams guy you guys are talking about? I don't really know who this guy is. Wait, wait. What? But, I mean, surely he's not in, I mean, that was like, maybe, maybe Trump would do that, right? Like, maybe Trump would give Elliot Abrams a, a role in his cabinet, right? Like, certainly, certainly, it, it would just be Trump that did that, right? Yeah, that's, uh, only, only the Trump administration would do such a thing. See, in 2021, Abrams founded a new group called the Vandenberg Coalition, named after Arthur Vandenberg, who helped build the foundations of NATO after World War II. The coalition involved Morgan Ortegas, a former State Department official, Randy Schooneman, a neocon lobbyist, and a former head of the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, Doug Feith, a former Defense Department planner for the Iraq War, and Scooter Libby. Wait, I'm sorry, what does this say? Wait, hold, let me zoom in on this real quick. I couldn't... Did that say... Am I seeing this correctly? It here it says that the guy who ran defense, ran cover for the El Mazote massacre, was appointed by President Joe Biden to the nonpartisan U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. I can't. I. I di what? What? What do you? What? Hmm. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you already knew this stuff and you're acting. No. No. No, not at all. I would never say America bad for very valid reasons. I would never. I would never say things like that. I'm just simply stumbling across why America's bad on a Wikipedia page, which is 
certainly not a tactic so that I can get the Hassan only says America bad debate perverts to like finally come on board now that I can portray myself as someone who wasn't previously knowledgeable on the issues and actually just stumbled across it right now in the in the most favorite uh, style that they're used to. I certainly didn't do that. That's <laughs> that'd be crazy because that would require previously knowing about these things by reading extensively on the subject matter. And I would never do that because that's gay. What's actually super cool is saying America good and then opening up a Wikipedia page and then maybe finally coming to the conclusion that maybe it's not so good. Maybe it's kind of bad. Yes, reading is both gay and Marxist, which is bad and g doubly gay. Unless you're reading, reading a Wikipedia page and then you arrive at that conclusion. So, whew, wow. Huh. Do you really just use gay as a pejorative? I used double gay as a double pejorative. What about opening a Wikipedia page and still thinking it's good? Yeah, I don't know what to do at that point. It's like you're unsalvageable. Anyway, um, that's weird. That's weird that that happened with Elliot Abrams, who, who, uh, you know, defended the death squads that threw babies in the air and used a bayonet to kill them. Hmm. Let's continue. Thousand innocent Salvadorians, half of them children. And that's the kind of violence that the people from El Salvador were fleeing when they migrated to the US. In LA, young Salvadorians were met with the violence of gangs that didn't accept them. So they created their own, La Mara Salvadorucha Stoners, which eventually became MS-13. In the 90s, when the gang violence and crime in LA became too much, the US deported convicted criminals back to their countries. Thousands of gang members were sent back to El Salvador, a country that had just been torn apart by civil war. In that environment, the gangs flourished and subjected the Salvadorian people to yet more decades of violence. But in 2019, Thank you, 34MKD50, for the 50 gift of subs. Remember, she didn't even mention the most important part, dumping the, the gang members into El Salvador without telling the El Salvadoran government that they were gang members. As in, like, like here you go. You're free to do whatever the fuck you want to do in El Salvador. Go ahead. Have fun with that. That is what we did. Doesn't seem like it's something a good guy would do, you know? It just doesn't seem like it'd be a good thing to do to a country that is already in the throes of civil war. Um, yeah. Anyway. Ali Bukele brought change. During his first year in office, homicides went down by almost 50%. And then in 2022, there was a setback. In March, the gangs killed 87 people in one weekend. And Bukele and his legislative assembly responded with an iron fist. They declared a state of exception. It gave police the power to detain anyone without a warrant, without having to tell them why, and people lost their right to an attorney. It's always a good, it's always a good way to, to address any problem <laughs> by, by just throwing everyone in a super prison that you built. In the first two months of the state of exception, police arrested more than 35,000 people. A year in, Bukele had managed to dismantle the gangs. Salvadorians could now go into neighborhoods where they had in a 1998 interview, Abrams remarked, while it was important for us to promote the cause of human rights in Central America, it was more important to prevent a communist takeover in El Salvador. Yeah. Can't have that, dude. He said a Cuban-style revolution. By the way, the, the correct, I think the, ter the term he uses is... Let me see if I can find the quote. ...dared step foot in years. Vendors could sell without getting extorted. And Alba now feels at peace in her community. Nadie había hecho esto de poner mano dura sobre las pandillas. De lo que yo tengo uso de razón, que se han sentado y se han ido y se han sentado gobierno. Nadie. In May, Bukele celebrated on Twitter that El Salvador had gone 365 days without homicides, a full year. Tenemos más libertad, más seguridad. 
por primera vez empezamos a vivir y sentir la verdadera paz. Bukele has been making sure the world knows what he has done. A former publicist, the president shares highly produced videos of tattooed men getting rounded up. The videos have been seen around the world and they've gotten Bukele a lot of praise. Like for the record, I'm not even a, why are you so against getting rid of crime? I don't think all crime is the fault of US imperialism. Dude, come on. No, we're not doing this. I'm not going to relitigate how we are involved in this, okay? The real crime is you thinking that you can bait me into the top of the hour ad break by saying some dumb shit like that, okay? Yeah, I know it's the top of the hour, and here's a crime. Watching the stream without subscribing at the top of the hour and avoiding those ads by using illegal means. Don't do it. Just kidding. We're pro-crime on this broadcast, as always. But if you are a law-abiding citizen who doesn't have any tattoos, then subscribe for $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime to avoid the top of the hour ad breaks. Here's the three-minute ad break now. But the videos the president shares don't show people like Esmeralda Dominguez. In that document, it says that I am a member of the Mara Salvatrucha. I prefer a handful of citizens getting incarcerated for the safety of the whole country, to be frank. He really doesn't seem like a bad president. <laughs> Bro, how about 70%? First of all, this implies that, like, I'm not in favor of arresting and locking, like, murderers up. Okay? I very much am. I am not, like, anti the existence of any form of stopping people from... Jesus, I take it back. Yes. Okay. So that's good. At least we established that. Okay, it's just that I believe that when you arrest and apprehend these people, there should be a mechanism set in place not to like permanently detain them, but instead to try and claw back a gigantic percentage of those guys from the throes of violent crime into productive members of society. And that only happens through rehabilitation. It does not happen with mass incarceration. That's number one. Number two, in order to do that, in order to do that, in the way that Bukele has done, he's just dropped all of the fucking due process. No habeas corpus whatsoever. They are designated as terrorists. And a shit ton of people get caught in the fray. This is a major problem. A ginormous problem. It's There's one short-term problem caused by that. Obviously, you're just like further radicalizing people who weren't actually criminal elements at all. They were not working with the gangs. They were maybe tangentially related as a consequence of like proximity, right? Or maybe they were threatened into working with the gangs because you're talking about like those corner street like vendors and stuff that are now being arrested for being a part of the gang when they're not actually a part of the gang. They're just being extorted by the gang. So that's a huge issue because now those guys are treated as criminals, most likely will be radicalized. They have nothing else. So that's bad in the short term as well. But in the long term, it is devastating because you cannot maintain a permanent prison state like this look at the united states of america they forfeited their human rights when they did those atrocities these people are too far gone no need to rehabilitate got it dude thank you silent civilian yeah that seems great <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter luckily your dumbass is not making these decisions and well technically dumbasses like you are making these decisions in el salvador but that's not how this works your goal is to make society prosperous, okay? Your goal is to make society prosperous. It is not, and to ensure that you have a prosperous society, of course, there is going to be crim enforcement of criminality, making sure that criminals are apprehended, making sure that they are detained, making sure that they are no longer doing crimes. The notion that this will be good in the long term is insane. It's idiotic. It's not going to work. He saved my country, you asshole, poophead. He's not going to he's not going around arresting anyone with a tattoo. These people have gang tattoos. I don't think you understand the kind of savages MS13 are. I do understand it, as a matter of fact. We've I I've I covered it. Covered it extensively. This isn't the USA, bro. We don't want those guys out being librarians. It's absolutely awful for those who did get locked up and are not criminals. <laughs> Thank you, crucially, too. If jail people have no rights, all the government has to do is prosecute someone for a crime, any crime. Oh, you're a leftist? Guess what? You're also a drug dealer now. There you go. The fact that 70% of those 
who are currently in detention do not have any gang, any like valid gang relations is insane. He's like, ah, some people go to jail. Who cares? It's like, yeah, that's why I'm not talking about like the actual dudes who like decapitate and rape children. Okay. I'm talking about the guy who's extorted as a shopkeeper who now is in jail with the guys who decapitate people. That's my point. That's a really f process. I'm simply saying there should be due process. Hello? Yeah, I also did show that the guy who at least facilitated the decapitation of children that we know of is currently in the Biden cabinet. His name is Elliot Abrams. But that's besides the point. That's not even, that's neither here nor there. She was arrested when one of her daughters was only four months old. By the time she was released, her baby was one. And Esmeralda was given a document accusing her of being a gang member. ¿Y por qué si soy miembro activo estoy afuera? Si se supone que él dice en su gran publicidad que todos los que son, él los tiene hasta en un penal que es para ellos y que él no va a dejar salir a ninguno. Esmeralda says the conditions in prison were inhumane. Ahí hay piojos, ahí hay enfermedades, no hay higiene, no hay agua, ocho días sin bañarnos. Si habían enfer enfermedades, aquí alguien estaba enfermo, nunca habían atenciones médicas a menos que ella estuviera prácticamente muriendo o muerta porque hubieron varias que ya la sacaban y ya no regresaron, murieron. She says what's missing from Bukele's propaganda is how the state of exception has deepened poverty in communities like hers. Por ejemplo, yo no puedo tener un trabajo formal porque me están pidiendo antecedentes penales. Esmeralda is a farmer and in the eight months she was in prison, her crops got ruined. And her partner, whose income she counted on, was also arrested and is still detained. ¿Cómo va a ser para sobrevivir? Dígame usted. Sometimes Esmeralda has to skip buying her daughter's medicine because she doesn't have the money. Le digo así, soy sincera, a veces no sé ni de dónde. While Esmeralda was detained, it was her mother who took care of her daughters. You mentioned this already. This occurred all over Latin America. The military dictatorship in Brazil follows a similar pattern, targeting leftist journalists and artists, anyone they deemed as adversaries. Yeah. The pre people are eating the propaganda, going, oh, well, they're arresting criminals in a country where their crime is a massive problem, right? So then they don't recognize that their own civil liberties, they are advocating for their own civil liberties and the civil liberties of their family members that are still in El Salvador getting removed. That's the craziest part about this. Oh. But again, I, I, I do understand if you are Salvadoran and, and I understand why your parents will be more reactionary on this stuff because it's like it is definitely not the normal amount of crime that you're used to in a in a country like the United States of America. Like it's very different than that. Well, Esmeralda's mom, Kelly mom is a survivor of the violence of the 80s when the government was killing farmers who were fighting for their rights. Once again, she says her family has become a victim of the state. <laughs> El Estado sabe, pues, quién, a dónde, pero lo más fácil es agarrar al inocente. Yes, he is. I'm Salvadoran dog. My aunt almost went to jail last year. Her crime, she treated gang members of her job. Is a nurse, chatters fighting. You are either painfully white or just reactionary dumbasses. Yep. Chatters about to be like, well, she didn't go to jail. System works. It's not because of my hubby that I found you, and thank God I did, because I'm also Salvi, and I don't care too much for Bukele. Thanks for sharing the truth. Like... I think a lot of people are mistaking my coverage in this as like, no, MS-13 should like run rampant and, and Salvadoran gangs should run the country. That's not what I'm saying at all. Okay. I'm simply stating that this is not a good solution to the problem and it's only going to make the conditions worse. It seems, it seems like in the short term, you're, you're seeing benefits, right? You're like, oh, well, you know, some, there's some issues. Sure. Fine. But what you're failing to recognize is that this has been tried, tested, and failed time and time again. This method is not a good method. It's also especially interesting that we're having this conversation uh, in the eve of what happened in Haiti, where, like, they literally just broke into the fucking prisons and released a shit ton of the prisoners in Haiti. A subject I don't usually broach that much, because there's no way to... Cover it adequately. I just, I don't know enough. 
Right before the state of exception, Bukele said there were 70,000 gang members in the streets of El Salvador. Since then, almost 74,000 people have been detained. But a report from the National Police of El Salvador leaked in September showed that almost 43,000 suspected gang members were still free. So if there are that many gang members still free, the question becomes, who has the state been arresting? Those numbers don't add up, dog. What the f***? Stop being lazy. You are one Wikipedia away from being an expert on Haiti. Yeah. Damn, the math ain't mathing, but what do I know, you know? They'd been arresting. This is the public defender's office of El Salvador. People come here every day trying to get news of their relatives that have been detained and that they haven't heard from in months. It's common to see a long line like this every single morning. The same month that her son was arrested, a police union in El Salvador said officers were being pressured to meet daily arrest quotas. El Salvador now has the highest incarceration rate in the world and its president is the most popular leader in Latin America. That popularity has allowed him to amass a lot of power. Bukele now controls all three branches of government in El Salvador. That's how he's able to run for re-election, even though the constitution forbids it. A president is not supposed to serve more than one consecutive term in El Salvador, but the legislature from Bukele's party replaced the judges on the Supreme Court. And then that court ruled that he could seek re-election. In response to criticism that he's dismantling democracy, Bukele calls himself the coolest dictator. Bukele has changed the laws. I think that's the worst part about it, is that he's so fretted, dude. And Javier Malay too, God. South America, Central America is shaping up to be just a war of like, you know, subtle social democratic candidates versus like the most redditor anarcho-capitalist motherfuckers you've ever seen to make himself more powerful, while Salvadorians lose the rights that used to protect them from the state. Remember Carlos, the young man who used to get extorted by the gangs? He says he went from being a victim of gang members to getting accused of being one of them. Carlos, his father and grandfather were on their way to work when they got arrested. Yo iba delante y este alcancé a ver un soldado que iban cubriéndose una vuelta. Ellos sin inmediatas palabras, sin preguntar nombre ni nada, le dijo a, a mi familia que iban a quedar detenidos porque había una orden de, 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 de arresto porque los acusaban de que eran pandilleros. Carlos says they weren't going to arrest them at first, but he questioned the officer. Solo me dijo, mira vos andate. Vine yo y me le acerqué al, al señor agente y le dije yo que yo quería saber que cuál era la razón de, de la detención. Pero me dijo que por pendejo y metido me iban a llevar y como él vio que yo me fijé que en el papel no tenía nada, pues Algo creíble, pues. Entonces, él dice, tengo una orden uh -huh. para arrestar a estas personas. Sí. Tú dices, déjame ver, y en la lista no hay nombres. No, no hay nombres. Salvadorian newspaper El Faro examined the court documents of 690 people detained during the state of exception. They found that police sometimes reported they arrested people for reasons like they looked nervous or suspicious, that someone had anonymously accused them. Bro, I swear to God, like, there's cops looking at this and just busting nuts. And the fucking cop chatters in here also defending this shit. Jesus Christ. Conservatives love talking about 1984, brother. And it's like, when they when it's staring at them, they're like, but it's good, actually, because it's the brown folk that are going to jail. I like it. Straight fascism, brother. Holy moly. Or they had tattoos. But in the reports, they didn't specify if the tattoos were gang-related. None of the 690 people named in the documents were accused of murder. Carlos says most men he was detained with were not gang members. El 4 de, de junio, cuando llegaron a la audiencia, había unos 544 en esa audiencia. Y de los 544, solo habían 32 que dijo la jueza que sí estaban. Sorry. It's great. All right, let's get back to not the United States, but. Uh, a country that we've uh, still contributed greatly to in a negative way. 
El Salvador. De, de junio que nos llevaron a la audiencia. Había unos 544. Yeah, this is the craziest part. They just like put you in front of a judge with like 200 people. En esa audiencia. Y de los 544 solo habían 32 que dijo la jueza que sí estaban. And only 32 members were actually tied Realmente to the gangs. Realmente vinculados a pandilla y que sí andaban tatuados. Los habían hallado con armas. They were found uh, only 32. Droga. Imagínense que de tanta gente, pero ni la mitad siquiera, pues, para tapar algo que dicen que solo pandieron a Raúl. Para nosotros sentimos que esto de Reyme iba a ser un suspiro para nosotros porque, pues, iban a poder trabajar libremente y, y ese dinero nos podía quedar a nosotros. Pero no. Aquí, de las personas que uno conoce que han andado en la situación, ahí andan, pues. Entonces, ¿cómo va a estar seguro si ahí están infiltrados? El rato que, que ellos quieran armarse, vuelven y vuelven a hacer lo mismo que eran antes, pues. En muy poco tiempo, El Salvador pasó de ser la capital mundial de los homicidios, pasó de literalmente ser el país más peligroso del mundo, a ser el país más seguro de América Latina. When you take a closer look at the president's messaging, the cracks start to show. Like the announcement of a full year without homicides. Bukele's tweet now has a community no fact-checking the claim. A few weeks after the tweet, local media reported that the government's own internal documents showed homicides were 61% higher than the Bukele administration oh. was telling the public. A ver cuánto tiempo duran sus homeboys allá adentro. Ustedes desatan una ola de criminalidad y nosotros quitamos la comida en las cárceles. Bukele has said he will not spend public money to make gang members feel more comfortable in prison. But Carlos says the gang members he was detained with got special treatment. Los espaguetis. Una de las dos cosas, o lleva cucaracha o te lleva este excremento de rata. Asqueroso, pero es lo único que hay. Po. Y fíjese que a los pandilleros, a los que están condenados. They don't report it unless the body is found, so they underreport crime. Well, one can think that, one could state that maybe they're just trying to incentivize criminals to be better at crime. Have you thought about that? It's kind of like... Um... It's kind of like uh, the the uh, principle behind like every time you kill a spider, you're technically making spiders better. You know what I mean? Because like if a spider got got, well, next time spiders need to be smarter. You know what I mean? You've made the collective of spiders smarter by taking out one of the dumb ones. It's kind of like that. Tienen un menú variado porque a ellos les llega carne, les llega este medallones, les llega chorizo, les llega salchichas. O sea, que tú veías que trataban a los pandilleros mejor. Sí, por ejemplo, ellos este, andaban más cómodamente. No puede decir, me han contado, yo lo he visto. Gang members getting preferential treatment in prison is not new in El Salvador. The administrations before Bukele negotiated with the gangs. They offered them... I mean, dude, before people say, this is something that people keep asking. By the way, the reason why we watch this 19-minute video is because it leads into this much more popular video right now that's blowing up, talking about the insane prison system, and I didn't want to go into it ill-equipped, especially with an audience that was, like, unfamiliar with the situation on the ground. But before you ask, like, oh, what's a better solution? I, I have a better solution. It's not to, like, not apprehend criminals, okay? It's to continue having due process. It's like, that's it. Not having dragnets and fucking arresting people willy-nilly. This video, the video, Lucito video is ba biased in favor of the prison also. Yeah, exactly. Them ...benefits in prison in exchange for keeping the number of homicides low on the streets. El Faro revealed that Bukele did it too. After El Faro's reporting, the Attorney General's Office of El Salvador started an investigation. And prosecutors obtained security camera footage that shows a Bukele official entering a maximum security prison. He was accompanied by masked men, some of whom prosecutors say were at-large gang members who were going to receive instructions from gang leaders in prison. Bukele denied the accusations, and then the legislature, which is controlled by Bukele's party, removed the attorney general who was investigating the government's negotiations with the gangs. But there's another investigation that's still ongoing, and that's the one by the United States government. The U.S. has also accused Bukele's administration of cutting a deal with the gangs. The Department of Justice says El Salvador's government protected MS-13 gang leaders from being extradited to the U.S. to be prosecuted. One of those leaders was Elmer Canales, known as... Okay, to be fair, America, what are you doing? First you deported them, now you want them back? Like, make up your mind, you know what I mean? Which is it? Do you want them back or do you want to fucking dump them out? I'm sorry. Hello?
It's like you can't send him back to El Salvador and be like, actually, never mind. We fucked up. We want him back. Can you please send him over? It's like. It's crook. Crook was in prison in El Salvador when the U.S. asked that he be sent to New York to face charges for terrorism. But instead, he was suddenly released, even though he still had 40 years left to serve in prison. While El Faro obtained an audio recording where a senior Bukele official admitted he helped Crook escape prison. <laughs> they wanted him back so they could send him again to El Salvador without telling, without telling the government. They were like, come on, come on, send him back, come on. No take backs. You said no take backs? He's, okay, well, we lied about that. Come on, give it to him. Prison in 2021. Last November, U.S. officials found Crook in Mexico. Carlos says while he was in prison, he witnessed a visit from Osiris Luna, the Bukele official seen in this image. En el salco, un día llegaron a sacar todos los, los pandilleros. Y llegaron un grupo de personas con cámaras y todo, y ahí estaba el señor Osiris Luna. Y cuando ellos iban, o sea, fue como video lo que hicieron. Cuando ellos regresaron a la celda, llevaban paquetes de galletas que les habían dado por bajar a hacer el video. Carlos says, ironically, the people who are not associated with the gangs are the ones suffering the most in El Salvador's prisons. He says guards brutally beat them. A mi abuelo, en, en el penal también, Allá le pegaron más fuerte que a nosotros porque decían, a él le chorreaba la espalda de agorrotarse. Entonces, eh, de los muchachos que iba con nosotros, a uno le quebraron unas costillas. El muchacho llegó a de arrastres al, al, a la celda y él pegaba gritos porque es un dolor insoportable. Por las noches él le agarraba fiebre, empezaba a delirar como a las dos semanas de, de estar ahí. Murió el muchacho en la misma celda donde yo estaba. A human rights group from El Salvador found that more than 200 people have died while in custody since the beginning of the state of exception. They estimate that almost half of them were murdered. Carlos worries for his father and grandfather who are still detained a year and a half later. El gobierno está usando las instituciones para matar a la gente. Y los pandilleros que han matado a la gente humilde. Y lo mismo está haciendo el gobierno. Está matando a la gente pobre, la gente que no tiene quien, cómo defenderse. Pues. The lives of the people we interviewed look very different from the images of El Salvador that reach most of us. And it's almost like they're two countries, one for tourists, Bitcoin influencers, and beauty queens that looks like peace and prosperity. And another one for the Salvadorians who live in the most impoverished communities, where safety feels fragile and human rights don't apply. Nice. This was phenomenal. This person is incredible. Bianca Gerlau. Uh, I believe she's Puerto Rican, right? Someone was saying in the chat. Go over there and give it a like. Oof.